Hola, bienvenidos a mi podcast. <laughs> uh, hola, friends. Rob Bell here, sending love to all my friends out there. Uh, just heard about people in Germany, a whole crowd of people in Germany listening to the Robcast. Guten Tag, Guten Morgen, whatever it is. Um, and all of you in the UK. And uh, my brothers and sisters in South Africa, sending you all kinds of love. And uh, how can we forget our friends in Mexico City and uh, Rodrigo? I'm talking to you out there on the coast. And uh, my friend Tiago in Brazil. And sending all kinds of love to our Australian friends and our New Zealand friends. And then, of course, those of you north of us. Canadians wondering what in the world is happening south of you. <laughs> what is going on? Um, sending love to all you. And so glad that you're here for this episode. And uh, oh, especially sending love to those of you in Phoenix and Tucson and Santa Barbara, California, and San Diego, because I'm coming your way in uh, over a month. A little over a month, the Holy Shift Tour will have our first few tour stops. I'm bringing along Pete Rollins. And uh, so the first four cities are in Arizona, Phoenix and Tucson, and then California here, San Diego and Santa Barbara. So all the tickets are up for the whole first leg, which I think is 20 cities. Um, first leg tickets are now up at robbell.com. Um, it's a good chance I'm coming your way, if not first leg, maybe later legs. And would love to see you. And I'm uh, this tour... This thing I'm going to be talking about, uh, it's like a monster of an idea. I always know when it's time to do a tour when I have something that my first thought is, I don't know if I could pull that off. Uh, like the Everything is Spiritual tours when I was like having those big whiteboards made. It always began with that idea, those ideas. If I could connect all of that in like a two-hour, one-man show thing, it was always this incredible explosion of joy coupled with, I don't know if that's even possible. That's like like a daunting awe. <laughs> like I might, I might have bitten off more than I can chew here. That's exactly how I feel about this Holy Shift Tour. Um, is like, if this works, man, oh man. If it doesn't, we will bomb spectacularly. But that's the way to do it, right? <laughs> you got to roll the dice. And uh, if you're going to go down, go down in flames. You know what I'm saying? Um, speaking of going down in flames, my first novel, uh, we made a limited run of hardcover versions of it designed by the incomparable Todd Luter. Um, so the novel is called Millones Cajones. It's about a motivational speaker who has a meltdown. <laughs> and uh, uh, there are some copies left, especially for those of you who have somebody that you, you're the sort of the people, person who gives people gifts this time of year, and you're wondering, what do I get? It's the, you know, that's the thing that they would never have thought of that they need. <laughs> so, um, Millones Cojones, my first novel, limited edition hardcovers at my site, robbell.com as well. And then, of course, Largo Christmas Show, and the band Joseph will be with me, and we're doing a Christmas show, um, and uh, those of you who have been before... Um, yeah, or you haven't been to Largo, and you just, you know, we'll put you in the Christmas spirit. I'm going to be talking about Mother Mary and her favorite band, Rage Against the Machine, and all that. Um, you know, it'll be good times. So, there's some things going on. Now, I get to introduce you to Kristen Hange and Natalie Roy. And I don't even know how to intro this interview. Um... I had met them and hung out with them and felt like I was meeting sisters from different misters. I had this strong sense, oh, these are formidable spiritual teachers who have so much to show us. I knew going in it would be something, but oh man, uh, you, yeah, I don't, I don't even know how to prepare you for the goodness coming your way. So my friends, here you are. Kristen and Natalie. Okay, friends, it is hot here in the back house, but we are cool. I'm here in the back house 
with my new friends, Natalie Roy, Roy, <laughs> the French pronunciation. So close. And, so close. <laughs> and Kristen Hengis. Good job. Was that good? That pronunciation was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how I've heard it butchered. The bar is low, <laughs> it's apparently. very low. But that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so um, it's really hot in here. We have a bunch of fans, so if you hear that, that's because we're trying to stay cool, because the air conditioner would just blast us out. Um, I first met you guys at Largo. Yes. Correct? That's After right. a show. That's right. And you told me a little bit about what you're up to now. I was like, oh, interesting. Then we hung out that time. Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, they're... My Robcast people are going to love them. So here we go. Um, Robcast friends, these two make me laugh really hard just sitting here. And, but they're, they're up to something very, very interesting that I think, and the first time I met you, you told me what you were interested in, what you were doing. It was very targeted and focused, and yet I kept thinking, it's like the particular is universal. Like, wait, 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 you're talking about how to live, even though you're doing something very specific. So we're going to get into that, and then maybe we'll work our way towards what this has to do with all of us. To, Perfect. to be as broad and ambiguous as possible. So, Natalie, acting is your background. Acting is my background and foreground. And foreground. And Kristen, directing. That's correct. Like Rock of Ages, mm -hmm. Broadway, yep. movies mostly for mm -hmm. you, Natalie? Movies, film, TV, whatever okay. someone will pay me for. You, <laughs> <laughs> you both live in New York. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you met up and had an idea of something you would do together. That's right. Yeah. So How basically, Kristen unfold? was living in Los Angeles, and she was teaching. And she was teaching basically steps in the creative process for when you have a dream and you don't know exactly the steps to take that dream into reality or manifestation. I was living in Toronto at the time, teaching the same thing, but I was teaching it more from the yogic perspective because I have a background as a yoga teacher and a psychology background. So I was taking those modalities and applying them to the same concept, how you can take a dream and bring it to life, bring it to manifestation. So when we met, it was kind of like, oh, you're my twin soul and tell me what you're doing and I'll tell you what I'm doing. And even though they were from totally different traditions, East and West, they matched up perfectly. It was a little strange. I would hear in meditation every morning, when you move to New York, you're going to call Natalie and ask her to start teaching with you. And it was so loud, it was annoying. <laughs> And so there's this really funny story of like, I asked Natalie to go to lunch with me. And uh, so we meet for lunch and- I got all dressed up. I was so excited. Like Kristen Henge, the legendary director, wants to meet me for lunch. What did you think she wanted to meet about? I don't know. I had no idea. And, but, and then I started asking her all these questions. It was almost like, is this a date? Like what's happening here? Cause I'd be like, so tell me about your childhood. And like, I was literally like, I, cause I didn't really know her, but we were Facebook friends and I would see her posts and I was like, Oh, we're surfing like on the same wave. And then it would just come in in my intuition. And because I'm a director, all I know is to trust my intuition. That's where all the good stuff comes. And so what I- Were you taught to trust your intuition or is that something that happened that's something the more you directed. That's something that happened as I was directing. I started to realize as I was directing that there would be something within that would say, tell them to do this or cross down left or it wants to look like this. And the more I listened to that voice within that told me kind of like what to do, and sometimes it would come as a vision or sometimes it would be a, like a voice, that the better the show got. And so I was like, oh, oh, there's something going on in there. And then, so what happened as I started teaching, and I started with writers first, and I started teaching them how to, use, how to trust their own intuition, how to listen for inspiration, and started to see the results, I was like, oh, there's a thing going on here, people. There's a thing <laughs> that is happening and it's real. Okay, what <laughs> happened in the modern world that trusting your intuition is not like, duh, for lots of people? Well, you know what I, I mean? think it manifests differently, but I think it comes down oftentimes for most of us as control. Uh, that we would rather know all the steps, have it all figured out, and control the outcome. So we surrender the idea that there's always magic in what we don't know yet, and we surrender the magic of the beginner's mind, that when we approach something from this 
place of I'm just so curious what could emerge here and I don't need to know what the next step is to take the next step. I just need to be willing and available. And I think that sometimes, especially when we work with artists and I was working with, whether it's an audition coaching or working with actors of where they were feeling stuck or insecure or lost in the process, it was often because they were so busy avoiding their intuition to try to do what they thought they were supposed to do, which is all the story of how we've been conditioned, right? We, we, wow. we, what we notice, especially because we work mainly with artists and we believe that everyone is an artist. We know everyone's an artist, but that often people making things start to look to the outside world to get approval as opposed to really focus and go in. Something else that happened during that time when I was living in L.A. and Natalie was in New York, all of my actors from Rock of Ages started working with her and telling me that they were having these breakthroughs in their lives. They're like, do you know that she's a magical unicorn that can, that can cause my life to be better and really famous like uh, broad Did you know she's a magical unicorn? Yes. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah that's very like, Everybody I, knows that. I was like, I actually kind of had that sneaking suspicion. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, but, and then like really like famous like Broadway music directors and other directors started to tell me do you know about Natalie Roy? It was like, you know when the universe wants you to get a message? It was coming from every way possible that like I had to connect with her and like bring what I had been doing in California to her. And I had the privilege of maybe like six or seven years before, this was like what our relationship consisted of. I went to a <laughs> yoga class of hers and I could just like, I was like, I like, I like what she's about. Like <laughs> when she talks, I feel it all over my body. And that to me is a good sign that there is something divine happening. Wow. Okay, let's go. See, I'm still hung up on intuition because mm -hmm. I, I sense more and more people are realizing there are other ways to know things. Mm. Like the SAT and the ACT is how you get into college for a lot of people, which is such an unbelievably small slice of the how you know things pie. Yeah. And traditional schooling made me feel stupid. So I'm so attuned to all of the ways that we know things. Um, but let's go like you're, di you're directing and you have all these people working for you and technicians and actors and lighting and sound and music and all that. How does that work when you're like, ah, let's try this? Um, well, I, you know, I do believe in like oneness and one consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So that there is, there's like one vision that's trying to come through and maybe I'd be open enough to I can see it and interpret it. And I also believe that sometimes the divine whispers answers in other people's uh, heads. Uh, so I have to listen well yeah. enough because it might come through someone else. Yeah. Especially so, the people who trigger you, especially the people <laughs> who you're like, that person's vision is not my vision. If they're in the room with you, then they are on the team of the vision. And so your job is to get out of the separation of why you think there's something. Why would Divine be speaking to me and giving me intuition and not that person? And if that person so is the person in the room. So the person who most annoy you, annoys you or seems to be the greatest obstacle or hindrance to you getting your thing done is actually the person where you pause and listen all the more intently. It's like that's the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone is your teacher. That's right! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. Can you say a bit more about Beginner's Mind? Because I know for a lot of people. Yeah, so I think this is really important, that's especially. So, so from an actor's perspective, right? You pick up a script, and it's like, OK, I'm going to try to understand who this character is. And immediately, what you're trying to do is dump from your brain uh, your own projections of everything you think you're reading on the page, as opposed to saying, what is here? for me to discover? What is here for me to learn? What is here that the writer is trying to bring forth or communicate? So how can I get to know that writer and that vision without projecting my own self onto it? It's not different than going on a date and then spending the whole time trying to impress the other person by telling them who you are. And then that person is like, check, please. I didn't even get a chance <laughs> to talk, right? <laughs> but you're doing it with this really uh, pure place of trying to be liked or trying to be accepted yeah. or trying to show how much you know. But really I think it's the antithesis of the creative process because all creation comes from nothing. All creation comes from a place of there was not something there and it's like that spark or the word or whatever that brings something to life that wasn't there before. Yeah. So you can't know it yet. You have to be in the process of it happening. You have to be in the becoming of it as opposed to uh, already feeling like you know how it's going to go and right. directing Standing and Standing outside of it just directing traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that Latin phrase ex nilo, out of nothing. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. That's right. And that all the great things, there was nothing, and then there was something. I, uh, that's what I enjoy most first about my work, is there wasn't anything. And then there were these words that were arranged in a way. And somehow it's like, oh, I, it never gets old for me. And you emulate for us kind of what the, the create experience is, create our company, because you are like, like the other day when I was listening to um, the boat goat, Ron. Oh, goat for a boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, But I was like thinking, like you just kind of said it so in passing, like, you know, we were just like being playful and creating something. But that's the whole point. Like you, you create something. You don't know where it's gonna go. You don't say, oh, "Why am I not. making this?" Oh right. If it's silly to make this because I'm not a writer or I'm not this or I'm not that. It's like if something's coming through you, okay. I don't know what I don't know. I don't Absolutely. know what it's gonna be. Let's just right. go for it. Right, Let's right, ride right. the train. Why never occurs to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because we're here and we're breathing. Yeah. I guess. Be like my best answer. Yeah. <laughs> what else would I do today? <laughs> we always say that uh, how is not my job. Oh. And why is not our business? Mm -hmm. How is not my job and why is not our business? Because once you start asking why, you're going to talk yourself out of it. I mean, especially working with writers, the first question that, they will, that will always come up is like, why does anyone care what my story is? What, what, why does the, the planet need this? Like, there's all these ways that we can like, talk ourselves out of the fact that does our idea need to belong on the planet? And, but it's because there's something that happens, there's a surrender that happens when, you're, when you let yourself be like broken open by this new thing that wants to be born through you. Oh, that's so good. We should come back to this at the end, but I love that when people start asking why, you'll generally talk yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why question. it's just not our business. <laughs> it's like, if it's in you, it's supposed to be made. Just go with that, right? If the idea comes up inside of me, then that means divine universe, the source of love, whatever you want to call it, has said, you, here you go, yeah. go play, yeah. right? It would be like someone handing you um, a cake and then you being like, well, should I eat it? What happens if I eat What's it? Why for? would I eat it, <laughs> right? It's like someone gave it to you, so you just receive it. And so as we learn to receive... Um, the idea, then we can learn to receive the manifestation of the idea. Okay, so we're gonna have to talk about that as well. <laughs> so you all get together and decide you're going to start teaching together. Well, mm -hmm. I said no. <laughs> I said, Kristen, I am not a spiritual teacher. I'm I'm an actor, and I um, nowhere near have any of my own life together enough to tell anyone else, mm. uh, suggest what anyone else might want to do. Um, and Kristen was very insistent, like, um, I get that you're feeling no, but uh, Spirit already said yes, so there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> uh, and she, she was really, you know, saying, let me just send you what I'm doing. And it was really the moment I, I sat at my computer and opened up what she was doing and I was reading it like you know one of those things where you get a book and you can't put it down and like hours go by and you forgot to eat because you're so invested and all of a sudden it was just the sparks were coming in like we could do this and then we could do this and then this could happen so I just knew that that was a train I wanted to get on so I said yeah let's do this and and that was um well almost three years ago and we've been teaching together ever since so when you so you just put the word out we're going mm -hmm. to be teaching. Mm -hmm. Yep. What did you say you were going to be teaching about? Well, you know, I had been teaching in Los Angeles for already, like on and off when I didn't have a project, I would mm -hmm. be teaching for, for a, a nice chunk of years. And I, I knew, because the very first time I started teaching, which was over 10 years ago now, um, I started with three people. And by the end of that year, I had 40 people. And so I was like, this is what I know, and it's the same thing when you start a new show or you're, you're trying to do a movie or write something. We can start wherever we are, and it will grow by its own um, you know, it's velocity. It'll create a force, and it will grow it. So let's just start, and we'll just put it out there, and we're going to teach about the creative process. It was so fun because Kristen kept saying, um, we should just keep teaching, and I'm like, we're losing money. <laughs> like oh, yeah. the cost of printing the poster and renting the space, we're not even making. And she's like, trust me, we just got to keep going. Uh, see, and months, these are the months stories would I go love. by. I'm like, Kristen, we're still in the red. <laughs> 
been, but uh, you know, it was like holding the vision. Just get that dirt off it's, your shoulder. It's Come not, on, yeah. what's the problem? It's Little not money. our job to wonder about those things. We loved what we were doing. We loved what we had to say. We just kept going. And we were watching the people who we were teaching their lives being impacted in a huge way. So. You know, it doesn't matter if there are 10 people in a room or 70 people in the room. It's like, if lives are changing, let's keep showing up. And, y you know, I, I feel like Natalie and I both feel this way. We do it so that we can remember what we want to know for our own lives. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it is, it's, 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 a, it's a thing to be out there making stuff all the time. So the more often that we talk, about what is true, what happens, and this is what's exciting, is you start to see people who start to go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in that direction, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna try on this tool for size, and then you start to see them, their lives explode. It makes you go, oh man, it works. You know, yeah. I just gotta keep doing it myself. And so the more, um, so, th so, th so the teaching of the tools, um, I think, keeps our faith strong. Okay. I think this is so interesting that you had three people oh, and you lost the money. first time that we started. I think we had six. So it was it was it <laughs> and, was an upgrade. And some, from... and some didn't pay because they were like our friends that we begged to come. Yeah, <laughs> they're like plants. Yeah, that's right. But the number of people I meet who uh, want to start something. Yeah. Or they have this idea. It, well, X needs to be done better. Spiritual okay. communities, business, okay. whatever, whatever. But like it needs to be done differently. So, well, then just do it in your living room. Like, well, what if three people show up? And I always say. Oh my word, that would be, wouldn't that be awesome? Right? <laughs> because the most perfect three people for that moment and that message will show up and it will be the most profound thing, as opposed to having the, the 50 people that aren't actually really in alignment with you show up and then really and then not you're be into what you're who's doing. who's with me, who's not, and mm -hmm. it's like all this dead weight. Mm -hmm. This um, obsession with numbers is so fascinating to me because of how many people, if you could just take that out of their psyche, now you could actually have a shot at joy. Well, it's all the thing of um, keeping up with the Joneses in whatever you perceive that to be, right? So it's like the person beside me has this kind of house, this kind of car. I have to try to keep up with that. Okay, so if this spiritual teacher I love or this teacher I love or this actor I love or this person I love, they do it like this. It looks like this. They have this many movies. They have this much money, I have to do it like that or it is not a success. So we just love to just um, bless it all a success and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's I like it. one person came, we bless it a success. <laughs> I love it. You one know? person came. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Uh, I love uh, my friend Pete Holmes, the comedian. Love Thank Pete Holmes. Does, he has a bit he's been doing, like a new bit he's been doing about telling the audience, like, well done. Like you could be home watching Netflix, but you got in your car, mm. you braved traffic, you found a parking space. He does this whole thing. Good job. And this is you, you this is your first time being an audience, this particular group of people. He does this whole thing about <laughs> we're it. already winning. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, if you see it as a win, then like you can't lose. Like literally. You cannot <laughs> lose if you already think you're winning. <laughs> well and you know, one of the things that we talk about all the time in our workshops is detachment from the outcome, right? So so we got the chance to embody that as well. And um, so if we can be detached from what it needs to look like, um, then it allows something else to happen, right? Something new to be born from that place. So um, within a couple months of us starting, Natalie had an inspiration to reach out to one of the uh, local uh, studios and we went and... Well, it was kind of the same oh, uh, yeah. courting process that Kristen had to do with me. I, I was like in this acting studio going, oh, this is where we belong, this is our home. So, you know, I email the, the people who run the place, not interested. What if I sent them my headshot? Because we're really cute. Okay, we'll send our headshots, not interested. I'll give them a month, a month later. Hey, it's us again, just wondering if you're interested in our workshops, not interested. <laughs> but I had a vision that that is where we were gonna be, so we just kept on keeping on uh, and you know, going to other places. How many emails did you send that you got I rejected? Think, well, in the end, it was nine months, and I've, I would roughly reach out once a month. You sent emails <laughs> for nine months getting no, 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 no. Yes. And, and then one day it was yes. And one day it was yes. And it was yes, conditionally. It was, you can come and teach a free class mm -hmm. and the people who kind of like run the, the program here are gonna sit in on your class. And, and see if it's weird. And see if this is yeah. too weird for us. 
Um, and now here's what the fascinating thing is. At that time in New York, there was um, three of these kind of like acting schools, places where you would go and study and do casting workshops and things like that. And all of them were just based on kind of this business model. And we were trying to say, but there's a yin yang here. There's a way that as an artist, as a creator, you want to have kind of your business things in Tact, but if you're not building your confidence, looking at your unworthiness, looking at how jealous you're feeling and com competitiveness, if you're not looking at those things, it's not going to happen. So you can have the best resume in the world, but if you don't believe in yourself, where's it going to get you? No sustainability. Without any spiritual work. Right. Mm -hmm. This is all an empty exercise. That's, that's right. right. So, so that's what we were pitching, and they were like, this sounds woo woo. I don't know about these <laughs> girls. Um, so we went, we taught, and they were like, okay, you can do your course. We had this eight week course. They're like, you can do it once. You know, you can barely charge any money for it, but like, let's give it a go. But what happened is we started, and by the time we were done the first course, the room was jam-packed. And so we've been there ever since, and the room is always jam-packed. People are making, uh, every month we have like eight to 10 to 12 teams making short films. Like literally the community got transformed because they were never all in the room together outside of auditioning against each other. Competing. Well, mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, we believe that no one's just one thing. So everyone also has directors inside of them and writers inside of them and producers and, and, and spiritual teachers. And so we also watched people develop all parts of them, which is really exciting. Like for me, as a, as a woman, there's nothing more exciting than when another woman's like, I'm going to write a script, I'm going to direct a movie. And I'm like, we need your voices right now. We need them so bad. And so we got to see the community explode. And what was phenomenal was to watch them all fall in love with each other mm. and to watch how they support each other. So it was literally like the love that would erupt out and, and continues to, I think we would look at each other and just be like, what is happening? Because it's that, that feeling of like, let's say there's competing restaurants, right? And then one restaurant gets a good review and everyone at the other restaurant's like reading it and they're like, oh, they, uh, what do we got to do to get there, uh, right? That's what happens with all of us in our own way, whether it's other people you see parenting, whether it's other actors, whether it's other whatevers. You see separation and you see this compare and despair situation. Yeah. What happened is we, we started seeing this thing where actually on Facebook someone would say, I have an audition today, and a hundred people would go, you got this, it's good be great good for you and it's so it's changing uh, how the industry gets to look because we say that we end up having the power to create the reality that we want to live in and it isn't dependent on some big bad industry that we have no power or control over and so like sorry, a big enmeshed industry can be changed that's right everything can be changed and that we're creators right so that's what we are so we get to say what it looks like and what values we want in the work that we're doing so if we can think of it as there is like that we're all on the same team of there is a new awakening that's happening in the world and it needs the artists who are healers to tell these stories that will cause a catharsis in people that will cause change, right? So that, that's all that stories are ever doing is they're touching people, they're healing people, and that we need that right now more than ever. So once we start taking it out of the conversation of why am I not there yet, what's wrong with me, and oh my goodness, I get to make something, I get to be someone who creates something, I get to be, uh, I, get to, I get to go inside my imagination and see what wants to happen, I get to listen to my intuition, and it's gonna tell me what to do, um, and we're a big, we, we love to talk about Dharma, that we're all here with a purpose and that this purpose wants to be born through us and that the universe would not give us a purpose if it also wasn't going to give us all the resources to take that purpose and grow it. Okay, what's the number one thing that actors, what's the number one thing you say over and over and over again? What's the thing that if everybody got it? Your curriculum would like be way shorter. We we always start our class saying, um, in the same way, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a dream. So any time you think, uh, you know, the way I want to parent, the way I want to cook, the way I want to uh, write a film, the way I want to do anything is like I'm the lone wolf and I got this and I got to figure it out. Uh, then we are actually creating our own suffering because we need the village around us 
to uh, support us and uphold us so that this baby, this dream inside of us gets to grow in its most healthy way. And so I can be the most loving steward of this dream in the world, but I'm not going to be exactly the perfect thing for it at every given moment of its incarnation. So there's other people wow. needed in the process. And when we can surrender the ego of how personal the dream is, it's not personal, it's something the world needs. It's universal. And how grateful am I that a character or a story can come through my body? But it's not mine. It's coming through me because the world needs it. So I get to know what my piece in that puzzle is and just be grateful that I get to play. So the most, and this is most actors, don't have that sense. It's them against the world, them trying to get a job. And, and can I also say, and also writers, and also directors, and producers, and... So humans. Humans, right? Like, everyone <laughs> yeah. thinks it's about this kind of, like, striving. Um, when, you know, we talk so much recently, we've been talking constantly about letting go of separation mm -hmm. and coming back into the we are, we are all connected. Like, in the forest, the way that all the trees, their root, roots meet underground, we all affect each other. And that, like, th that we know on a quantum level that, like, what I'm feeling in my body, Natalie feels. As actors, no one, no one knows that more. Like, when you're in a scene and you're responding to each other, what someone brings to the party affects everyone in the room. Um, so, you know, we talk, about, we talk about community all the time. And we also talk a lot about inner and outer world that often um, we can run around in the world trying to change things on the outside, like make this better over here and make this better, but that all change happens internally. And so that if we really want to change our external, that we start inside. And we talk a lot about morning practice. We talk a lot about creating time for silence. We talk a lot about listening. So let's, okay, so let's say someone's listening to the Robcast right now. Let uh, a woman working a job where she's like, ugh hate this job, or a dad picking kids up in his minivan from soccer practice, but there's something in this person, mm -hmm. like, uh, there's something I gotta make. Mm -hmm. There's something I gotta do, somewhere I gotta go, something I, some leap I need to take. That's something that we hear all the time, is people will say, well, I really wanted to do X, Y, and Z, and then I chose to be a parent, so obviously I can't do both things, right? That, that's a really common thing of like, I, I decided to become a parent, so then my, my uh, other desires or urges then had to take a back seat until my kids are old enough and then I can maybe go back to it. But it's like what gets to be this beautiful gift as a family to say, oh, now you're on the team of my dream as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, and and I, I mean, you do that incorporating your kind of kids into your world all the time. It's like there doesn't have to be this separation of now it's all about you and your life. It's like they are also of you. So what your yeah. dreams are, yeah, include yeah. them. And yeah. I think that's really exciting. So when that itch starts to happen inside yeah. where you feel a calling, that's when it gets exciting of like, ooh, something wants, to, I'm getting pregnant. Something wants to, <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like there is something that wants to be given to the world through me. And if it scares you, then it's awesome. Pima Schroden has this quote that I love that says, fear is a natural indicator of moving closer to the truth. So when some- Fear is a natural indicator of moving closer to the truth. Right? Isn't that amazing? So when something Pima, comes come in- on. Pima, much. I know she takes me to church that one. Is that the one uh, all the things that scare us or what? She has like uh, when things she, fall apart. When, when things, things fall, fall apart. apart. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just all one the called things biting that scare the hook. us. I slaughtered that title. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good lord. Um. <laughs> By the way one time I told Kristen about uh, somewhere publicly with Kristen in the audience I said writing a book is the closest a man gets to giving birth <sighs> because of like you like had this idea and you like brought it to birth and you like on the world and Kristen was like don't ever use that metaphor <laughs> ever again. I love her so much. <laughs> she was like, seriously, don't. Just don't, um, ever. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Not, you don't get to say anything. <laughs> it's not yours. Was even anywhere near. Don't even say closest to. <laughs> but love I do it. believe that once that uh, arrives, that like kind of knocking, um, often it's persistent and it won't go away. And it has information in it. And what it really wants is time and attention to talk to you. So you can start really easy with like five minutes in the morning saying, talk to me. 
what do you already know? Oh, I love it. You know, it, it has information. It has all of the information. It has the information for the next step. And the, the other principle we talk about all the time is the masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. And we think of the masculine as that hustle, that passion, that go-getter, that doing everything. Initiative. Initiative. We think of the feminine as receiving, generous, nurturing, Connecting. listening, connective, intuitive. Many of us are so uh, conditioned that the masculine is how you get things done, right? You work longer hours, you you work right. harder. Oh, got that it, got we, it. We will often go immediately into the masculine. Okay, I have an idea, what should I do? And then we take 10 action steps only one of which will yield any kind of something. So what we could do instead is listen and say, hey, dream, like you would say, like, hey, lover, hey, partner, uh, what's the next step? And then you just take the one step. So you go from the feminine over to the masculine, but you gotta start in the listening. Once you receive that next thing, then you just take that one thing. You, we prevent burnout that way. We prevent running around, taking all these actions that won't yield what we want. And then we can actually conserve our energy for what we actually care about. We often talk that people can get dominant in one side of their energy. So if you're if, if you're all in your feminine, you're dreaming all the time, you have all these lofty ideas, but you don't have any fruit in your life. And if you're dominant in your masculine, you're working hard, you're always hustling, you, you are going, 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 but you get burnt out. And sometimes you don't know why you don't see the fruits for how hard you're working. So what we suggest is that we go into the feminine, we like commune with our idea, our, our vision, and then in the masculine, and we take the step it tells us to take. <sighs> That's, I've never heard somebody put it that way. So male or female, you mm -hmm. have divine masculine, have divine feminine with yes. each of us. By the way, I've been thinking, I was actually gonna do a podcast on the resurgence of the sacred feminine. Yes, please. Because that's, that's what our country world, world peace will probably begin with a research, will mm -hmm. be driven by the sacred feminine because the sacred, I would say broken, unhealthy masculine is making a mess of things. Yes. Right, and the rise of the sacred feminine has nothing to do with women trying to do what men have done. Correct. It has to do with women uh, taking the, the feminine path. And, yes. and men and yes. women learning how to lead in the feminine way, which is about community, it's yeah. about listening, it's about... Um, Interdependence, mm -hmm. connection, mm -hmm. Not, all of the entangle, all the healthy entanglements in which there are all boundaries dissolved because we are actually one. Yeah. Nurturing, love, oh, all of the things it. that um, that make everyone feel supported, and yeah. and and that so we feel we're like we're all on the same team again, you know. Yeah. In yoga, they talk about the masculine and feminine energy as um, like energetic uh, movement that runs up and down through your body, and there's these two lines that run along this thing called the shashumna nadi, which is our main Let's vital say that energy again. The center. The shashumna nadi. Uh, shashumna nadi. Yep. Um, and uh, so the, the shashumna nadi is what is I like <laughs> saying that by the <laughs> way. I was looking for another question so I could say it. The shashumna nadi is is what again? So that is basically this line line of our vital energy. This yep. is how, if we're going to take something from idea to manifestation, it's going to run up this line of energy. It's going to run up through our bodies. It courses through our bodies all the time. Now, for it to be healthy and working, there's two lines of energy, one that's masculine, which is called the pingala, and one that's feminine, which is called the ida. And pingala, ida. Pingala <laughs> and ida. Uh -huh. Ida. And they, pingala, they ida. intersect with one another along the points of the chakras. Right? So the mm -hmm. chakras in energetic anatomy are these points where we have the, the, these kind of clusters of energy and yep. each chakra represents kind of a different way we can get blocked, right? So fear, guilt, right. shame, grief, uh, lack of expression, things like that. So what it suggests is that when we are healthy and vital, whether we are male or female, being healthy in our energy is knowing that both are going to be present. And so anytime there is fear, there is a feminine response and a masculine response. And we want to balance those responses as opposed to always leaning on one or the other. Right? Come on. <laughs> right? Raise your glasses. <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, this, it's that interesting uh, thing w when you start to, like, get into conversation with that, that calling inside of you that also... Um, you know how we talked about you're only given one step? A lot of people don't want to start because they can't see the whole thing. Right. You know, right, that right. you only get, like, little by little. And it's not till you complete that next step that you've created room now in the feminine yes. to receive again. Yes, yes, yes. So you, you keep having to take the next step to receive again, and it takes a lot of being okay 
being inside the uncertainty of I don't know the next the the, the, right. the next ten steps. Step two and three and four. Mm -hmm. And but that when you take the first step, it fundamentally changes the landscape. So right now you're looking at it going, yes. well, I don't see well. Take the f first step, and now you'll have a completely different view. And and I'm sure that you could look at your own life and see this that if you had known how how things would move, you oh. would have gone, ah, I don't know. Dear sweet Lord. I don't <laughs> you know. know. I mean? I've thought about that. I've thought about that often. If I would have known, uh, I probably just would have charged that anyway. Right? <laughs> but, whoa. Right? Yeah. It, right. Sometimes, uh, if we see the whole thing, it's too overwhelming because most of us... Absolutely. It, it's like there's this thing that my teacher, Christy Marsden, who's a great yoga teacher, always used to say is that the acorn must become the oak tree. That's its design. And there's nothing we can do to mess that up. And then the oak tree can become a piano, but you can't go from acorn to piano. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so who you become in each step is actually what creates the ending. So you can't be at the ending because you have not right. been born of it yet. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> Mm. And, you know, something that's interesting that we know about the path of your dreams as well from our own experience and from working with so many people is it will also bring up all your stuff. So just like the way a good romantic partner will bring up all your stuff, the stuff that needs to be healed, going on the path of your dream will bring up all the unhealed parts of you that, that now need to be addressed for you to be whole. So if you're not good in conflict, as you go, you might be on step 43 of your dream and you're gonna be taken right into the middle of conflict because the universe desires for you to be whole. So we get this opportunity that as we go forward to heal all these parts in us. So, so what can happen sometimes is someone's, they're chugging along on the path of their dreams and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, conflict, and then they wanna bail. Mm -hmm. Like they wanna stop going forward because they got triggered or because their stuff came up. And that's when we're like, it's working. Right. It's really working it's now. It's not, a, like many people will perceive it as, I must have done something wrong. Right, I failed. It, now it got hard, so I must have gotten off the path. It's like we love, like Louise Hay always says, like it's all like green lights and all the parking spaces when you start manifestation, right? Like when you first start on this journey, it's like, oh, this spirituality stuff really works. Look how great it all is. And then it goes deep. And then you're like, oh, did I do something wrong? Because now I'm like in my stuff and I'm looking at some of those core sacred wounds and I'm having mm -hmm. uh, all Wait, of this core stuff. sacred wounds? Uh, core. Core sacred wounds. Yeah. What's that? What's that? Basically like the ones that really... Uh, there's a great book, The Untethered Soul. Michael Singer will describe it like this, who's the author. He says, you could be driving down the freeway. Let's say you and I are driving down the freeway, and all of a sudden a blue Mercedes passes by. And you have no history with a blue Mercedes, so it's like you don't even notice it goes by. I had um, an ex who I loved, who broke my heart, who used to drive me around in the blue Mercedes. So when I see the blue Mercedes, it's like wounded. But all that happened is a car drove by. Nothing mm -hmm. actually happened, but it simulated mm -hmm. in me mm -hmm. a, a wound. Now, the sacred wounds are the ones that are so deeply aligned with our dream because they're the ones that we're here to heal in ourselves and help heal in the world. Yeah. Right? So a major sacred wound that we're all dealing with right now is separation. That we, whether it's politically or... or um, with Mother Nature. Mother Nature, sexual orientation, we want to say them and us. And it's an opportunity to say that is like a core sacred wound uh, that many of us have inside of us. Where do I look at you and see separation? And I say, well, you're not like me. Or I, I have a preference of this person over this person. That's us creating in the microcosm the same separation that we're seeing on the big scale that we're also angry about. So in a way, I can get it. I know, right? I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that um, when your sacred wound comes up, whether it's like, you know, it's romantic relationships or it's finance or it's collaboration or whatever it is that is your, like where it gets to you the deepest, it's actually kind of exciting. It's like, oh, that means that's where I have a special gift. So inside of this thing that seems to be the thing that always gets me, that always like when I think I've really progressed, like, you know, I, I, I watch it come up in me. If I honor it, I can build a new relationship with it. It will transform me, it will transform my work, and it's what I'm here to give to others through my dharma or my purpose. Wow, it's so interesting. It's so, when I think about uh, my own work, so much of it was me working out my stuff, mm -hmm. and then just, well, this is what I saw. Yeah. This is what helped. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it, that's when we know that the personal yeah. is so deeply universal yeah. that none of it's ever yeah, personal. Yeah, I went far enough into me that some, has something to do with you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so many people were also in pain over that same thing, same thing right. that you were writing about that made them go, finally, oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah. you are it's helping me. like a collective me. sacred wound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, have come, I have way more questions, but I have a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it. Okay, so like you do, a, you do like a eight weeks, is that right? Yeah, so we started, when we started, we were teaching up an eight week class that went up through each of the seven chakras and the creative process. So for every of these vital energy centers, we talked about- How we get stuck, how we how get How we blocked. get stuck, yeah. uh, and what the kind of, how to balance the masculine and feminine in each chakra is. So it's kind of this uh, several oh, part got process. It. So the idea was if you had a calling or a dream or something inside of you, you could do this course and grow it. So you could take that acorn and help it become an acorn tr tree by moving through each one of these steps. So, so our friends who are listening who feel stuck or feel like I just, I'm pushing a rock up a hill or feel like nobody gets my idea or my life circumstances don't allow what you would start and then systematically sort of walk them through are you stuck here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's work on that. Maybe you're stuck in regards to the uh, first chakra is root chakra. Okay. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Muladhara. Muladhara. <laughs> Muladhara. I want you to have like With a lentils. like a cape and a hat and a bowl. <laughs> Muladhara. So you would start there. Yes. So we'd start in there, which is which is the root. So in the root, what we have is our ancestry our history, our family relationships, uh, finances, security, safety, just a sprinkling of those things. So mm. where do I feel unsafe due to my finances? Where do I feel unsafe to take the next step? Because in my past, when I've wanted to have an idea, it hasn't been supported or I've been told, well, you can't afford yeah. it. You can't do that. So immediately all of us say, oh, well, yeah, I always feel like I can't afford it, or if I had more resources, I would do this, or I grew up in a household that said, well, you have to be more realistic, you can't do those kinds of things, right? So all of us, even just to start, will already see so many ways that we uh, feel ourselves holding back from our dreams. Now, what's interesting about the root chakra is it's in our body, uh, basically in the pelvic floor area. So it's the place where our torso is connected to our legs, a.k.a. the place where movement can movement. happen. So the oh, shadow man. of the root chakra is fear. And what fear is, is the energy of retreating, right? If you're scared of something, you're going to move away from it. If you're in love with something, you're going to move towards it. So what most of us get stuck before we even start is by saying, here's all the conditions that make me afraid. So therefore, all the reasons for me to move away from this boulder I'm pushing, not realizing the boulder you're pushing is a treasure chest full of everything you want. Uh, so, you, so you begin at the most deep level with movement at like the deepest spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And you start there. Now, how does, how does root chakra, mundali, what is it again? Mundali? <laughs> Muladhara. Muladhara. Um, Muladhara. Uh, <laughs> That's so much fun to say. How does the chakra relate to masculine and feminine? So um, what we like to think is in the creative process, if you can think of like planting a seed in the ground, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what the root is like. It's like a foundation. So you have this foundation. You're planting a seed in it. We're going to take that seed, that idea, into the feminine. And the first thing we start to talk about is your vision and visioning. And that idea that we talked about, like the, one of the exercises, if we, sp if we spend time with it, like in the morning, five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. set your iPhone tire, it has information. So let it start to talk to listen. you. Yeah, listen, yeah. tell it, and, and write down everything it has to say. Start to listen to it in a new way. And then we take it over into the masculine. And one of the first things that we do in the root chakra in the masculine is we make a commitment to it. So, oh, interesting. right. So if you don't make a commitment to that seed, it's not going to stay in the ground. Right. So it, in a way, t spending visioning time is like watering the seed. Right. It's giving it good soil in the feminine and in the masculine. You're like, I'm going to protect this. I'm not going to let anything knock it out of the ground. So for each one of the chakra steps, we have a way that we take it into our feminine and take it into our masculine. And then we would have um, 
exercises for each one. So the reason the commitment is important is you could get five steps down the road and hit a hardship, and it's like you let your seed just get kicked out of the yeah, ground, right, right? Right, right? Like the moment the bank says no on the loan, you're like, well, then I'm not starting my dream kitchen. But the universe, and we say this all the time, is not going to give you an idea with all, without also giving you the resources for it. So, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a show and, like, went into a coffee shop and someone said, have you talked to this producer about it? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. there are oh, sure, so sure. many, I mean, unseen hands yeah. working with us all the time. So what we want to do is growing the idea is also going to grow our faith. The, oh, you have more to say on that. I do. Right? You, <laughs> you paused, and I was like, she's just getting warmed up. Uh -huh. um, well, just that then we get to start to see that, oh, I do have something inside of me that wants to be given to the world. Yeah. The world wants it as much as I want to give it. Yes. And that everywhere I go, I'm going to be given what I need. Now, once you start to see that everywhere you go, as you take that step, and if that step feels scary, and you take that step, you start to get what you need, you start to realize, oh my goodness, I'm supported by something that is so big. And you start to yeah. go, yeah. oh, there's a whole nother game we're playing here. Yes. And it starts to explode your life. And that's what becomes really interesting about growing this dream. So not only does it start, does your dream heal you, but you get to create healing for others through the growing of this dream. One of the things I used to say about, to writers all the time about their screenplay is, you're not supposed to figure out your screenplay. Your screenplay came here to figure out you. Came to bring up all your stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. This actually goes back to what you said about how many, the number one thing was people thinking it's they're all alone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the whole thing is rigged in your favor that's the it whole thing it, yeah. it, it's not only rigged in our favor but it wants to actually delight us do you know what i mean it wants to surprise us it wants uh to be in love with us it, it and i know that sounds really lofty but we've all had that moment where you know you're looking at your newborn child for the first time yeah. or you did something that you didn't think was possible to do or yeah. whatever and all of a sudden you're like struck with so much grace that you know it's not just about you but you know how loved and held you are in that process but i think many of us will actually forego our faith because we're so scared to admit how big the miracle could be mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah it's interesting in the bible it talks more and more as the Bible goes on about divine pleasure. Mm. Yeah, we that, that love pleasure is the engine of the universe. We love to talk about pleasure. We, we actually like yeah. to say that you know you're on your Dharma when it feels good. So mm -hmm. people will often ask us, well, how can I tell the difference between the intuitive voice or the voice of divine or the voice of intuition and the voice of my ego? And we're like, well, one's going to make you feel good and one won't. won't. I, I heard your friend Elizabeth Gilbert say once that uh, that voice sounds like grace. The voice of absolutely, intuition. you know, if it, it yeah. sounds like love. Yeah, and I've often heard people push back, like, "Yeah, but what about the cost? What about the difficulty? What about the sacrifice?" It's like, no, 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 no. That's when you hear it the most. Yes, because mm -hmm. you're like, "Oh, this is really difficult, and this is part of it, and that's <sighs> how it works." Well, and the reason okay. is, is because when it's the most difficult, you know, you can't do it alone. Yeah. You surrender, and when you surrender, uh, come it on. comes in, right? And what's interesting yeah, is, so yeah, yeah. if you've made a commitment to an idea and you start to step forward and you're and you're listening what's going to come up is all your limited beliefs. So things are going to feel like pain because you're actually just bumping into your limited belief that wants to be healed. So it's, it's your, your ego, your inner critic, that's going to come up with all these, like the things that feel like thorns as you move forward. Yeah. And those are what wants, want to be redeemed to come back to, to the loving thoughts that are the truth. It's like when you did your podcast about uh, boundaries. And you said, the one about boundaries. The one about boundaries. And it's like, how long can I be in the room with this person before I lose myself? Yeah. It's like, how many of us lose ourselves to ourselves? Because right. we're so busy listening to the ego voice all the time that we actually yeah, don't yeah. know who we are outside of that critical, nagging voice that says you can't. So when we can start to say, oh, there is the, the part of me that is listening to that voice, that is making that decision to listen to that voice, that I can also make the decision to say, hey, I get you, I see you over there, I give you love because I get how scared you are, but I'm also going to do this. Yes. Oh, come on. This all feels like an intro. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> this is the intro. Okay. 
<laughs> can civilians yes take your classes? We have a yeah. lot of we have um like architects, mm -hmm. we have uh, parents, we have interior doctors, designers, doctors, chefs. We have also everyone's an artist. Do oh see I like that. Do they have to come? They have to come at. Is it all in person? No, we have many offerings. <laughs> Look at these setups. Are these setups great? <laughs> They're perfect. To wrap up the show, they, I was just wondering. Uh, well, actually, so we um, we teach live, uh, mostly in New York, but we also have teachers that we uh, work with in Los Angeles. So we have create workshops in Los Angeles once a month and in New York once a week. Um, and then we also have on our website thecreateseries.com, uh, where you can come and we have uh, both a podcast that's free and we do our podcast on these topics that we're teaching oh, on every week. Once we interviewed Rob Bell on our podcast. There's this one podcast that has a lot of listens. <laughs> I remember that There's one. this guy on it. <laughs> um, I think we were like fangirling and screaming a lot of it. But yeah, if you want to hear us fangirl out over Rob <laughs> Bell, listen that's to that one, one immediately. Uh, but, we'll move uh, right along. It's an exciting time because uh, November 1st, this course that we're talking about which is our starting course, this yeah. eight-week course. Uh, we actually uh, did it as a live video series that we're selling online starting November 1st. And you can get that on our website. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we, we basically recorded each one of its eight different videos. And it t so if you have an idea, no matter what it is, you can, you can grow it with us. And on our website, too, we have, um, if you're kind of wondering how to get started, like, I don't know. I don't know if I have an idea. I think this sounds interesting, but I'm kind of lost. Uh, if you join our mailing list, you get this free downloadable, just like a document about how to design a morning practice for yourself or how to design that practice yeah. and how to start just listening and tapping in. Um, and then we also, oh <laughs> we also live stream our classes. So every week when we teach, people can live stream it. Um, and we also have like a Create Community Facebook page. Oh, of, which is so fun. And people just posting what they're going through and what inspires them and the miracles that they're having. Um, so that's CREATE as an ac acronym. Did I say that correctly? C.R.E.A.T.E. <laughs> Community. <laughs> you can it's just come there and get so sunshine. <laughs> you, I love it that you got together and made this. And what you just described is really, really impressive. And I love that it started with three people. Because yeah. every person is like, well, what if three people show up? Th yeah. And here's, That's a fantastic start. And here's another blessing. Sometimes we still have three people show up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you go through those ebbs and flows. Not really. Not really. I'm mean, like, you know, sometimes we have 30 people show figuratively up. Figuratively speaking. There are times when we have this idea that we think is so rad. Oh, everyone's going to be into this. And you throw it against the wall and people are like, eh, it wasn't your best. We're like, awesome. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But it, the point is, is not to judge the creation, but to just keep creating. I have that all the time. Mm -hmm. A couple people show up. It's like, eh. You go, okay. This is part of it, apparently. Yeah. Apparently, this is part of it. When we uh, allow ourselves to create from the true, authentic place inside of us that isn't concerned with outcome, uh, yeah. yoga yeah, says yeah. you're entitled to your actions, but not the fruits of those actions. So it's, it's your job to show up for showing up's sake. Yes. What happens is what happens. Yes. Oh, thank you for coming to the back house. We love the back house. I... Oh, man. I can only ma imagine people who are at this point in the podcast being like, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. I have to, like, process for a bit. <laughs> but I love that they can find you all online and yeah. get way more. Um, uh, our podcast is called Let's Play the Create Podcast. Cause Let's Play the Create Podcast? Yeah, That's so, if, you know, they Fantastic. can come play with us. Yeah. It should be fun. It should feel like pleasure. It, it should be like a charm you're following. That's it. Oh. So, seriously, <laughs> so inspiring. Okay, friends, thank you so much. Thank Until you. Until we meet again. Until. Yes. Which we know we will. Somewhere. I know. Okay. All right, my friends, grace and peace.